This is part two of two on chapter six, Introduction to Viruses. In the first part of the chapter, we looked at virus structure. In the second part of this chapter, we're going to look at how viruses are classified and how viruses multiply, the different types of viruses, and then um, what viruses do to host cells. And then finally, we're going to look at other types of infectious particles. So first we're going to look at how viruses are classified. So the main criteria presently used is virus structure, which we just looked at, chemical composition, and genetic makeup. So if it's a DNA or RNA virus. And currently there's three orders, 63 families, and 263 genre of viruses. And even though viruses are not living things, we still use our classification system to classify viruses. So to identify the different families or genres, so families end in viridiae. So a family name, for example, is herpes viridiae. Whereas if you're talking about a genus, it just ends in virus. So the simplex virus is one of the genres that we have. So you can name these viruses. You can have herpes simplex virus 1. So the herpes simplex virus 1 is found in the herpes viridiae family and it's in the simplex virus genus. And then they usually um, have the different types with Roman numerals, so 1, 2, or they can identify them based on other um, chemical compositions to distinguish between the different types of viruses. In table 6-2 in your book, this is a really good table to look at. It kind of classifies the viruses based on ones that are really important for human diseases. So different um, DNA viruses, so things like smallpox, cowpox, cold sores, genital herpes, those are um, diseases that come from certain DNA viruses, and you can see them listed here. Other viruses, we have RNA viruses that can also cause different diseases. Um, so hand, foot, mouth disease, I see as one example. The common cold is the rhinovirus, so that's the genus, because it ends in virus. And then continuing this table, we have more RNA viruses, and you can see all the different diseases that can be caused by different viruses. In animal viruses, we're going to first look at how animal viruses go through multiplication. And there's six steps to this multiplication cycle. So the first thing that happens, you have to have absorption. This is where the virus binds to the host cell using very specific molecules. In animal viruses, usually animal viruses have that envelope around them that have spikes. And as you learned in the first part of this chapter, those spikes in the envelope, they help the virus find the host cell and attach to the host cell. After adsorption, you have penetration. So the genome, whether it's DNA or RNA, it has to get into the host cell. And then after the virus gets into the host cell, you uncoat that viral nucleic acid. So this is the third step. And the nucleic acid is released from the protein capsid. After that, the nucleic acid hijacks a cell to synthesize the viral components. So that's the synthesis step, step number four. After the viral components are created, the cell will assemble, assembly, go through assembly, they'll assemble the viral particles. And then six is release, when those assembled viruses are released by budding, or it's a form of exocytosis, which the host cell does not die from budding, or the cell will lice open and viruses will just be released all at once. And that does lead to the cell dying in the cell lysis part. So if you're more visual, here we have the six steps in an image. So if you start at the top, you have absorption. So you can see the virus attaching onto the host cell membrane using spikes. Then you have penetration, the virus is brought in to the host cell. So step number two, the uncoating of your nucleic acid. And in this example, we have RNA as our nucleic acid. 
that RNA hijacks a cell, you synthesize all the materials. So we see we have new RNA molecules, new capsomeres to make up the capsid, and new spikes over here. Step number five, the virus is assembled together. So we put all the parts together. And then in this example, your virus is gonna bud off. And as it buds off, it's gonna steal its envelope from the host cell. And that envelope has the little spikes attached to it. So you have this release at the very bottom. So the first step, that absorption, and we're gonna look at what's called the host range. So there's a spectrum of cells that a virus can infect, and that's called the host range. Some viruses are very specific. For example, hepatitis B will only infect human liver cells. So it's very specific, a very narrow host range. Poliovirus, it has to infect a primate, intestinal, and nerve cells. So the range isn't as narrow, but it's still pretty specific. Whereas if you look at rabies virus, the rabies can basically infect any type of cell in any type of mammal. So it has a very broad host range. And the spikes in the envelope help determine what that host range is going to be because the spikes help the virus attach to the host cell. So in your animal cell, next you have penetration and uncoating. So your flexible cell membrane on your host cell is penetrated by either the whole virus is brought in or the nucleic acid is just brought in. And this happens by fusion. So this is where the envelope merges directly with the cell membrane of the host cell. And this results in the nucleocapsid or the capsid entering into the cytoplasm. So that's one type of penetration and uncoating. Another type is endocytosis, where the entire virus is engulfed, including the envelope, and then it's enclosed in a vacuole or vesicle. So this image is showing um, the variety of penetration and uncoating methods, the two methods we just looked at. So um, figure A at the very top, that's showing fusion. So you can see that the viral envelope fuses with the host cell membrane and basically the capsid with the nucleic acid inside of it is just pushed in to the host cell. So again, part A, that's the fusion method. Part B and C, those are showing the endocytosis methods and they're a little bit different, but basically instead of losing the envelope right away, having the envelope fuse with the host cell membrane, the envelope is brought in with the rest of the virus. And then the envelope either is disintegrated, the nucleic acid is let, let out, or the nucleic acid is let out of the vesicle, shown in part C. Our next step, synthesis and assembly. This varies depending on whether the virus is a DNA virus or an RNA virus. So a DNA virus is generally replicated and assembled in the nucleus of the host cell, whereas an RNA virus is generally replicated and assembled in the cytoplasm of the host cell. So the type of genetic information can influence what part of the cell your virus is synthesized in and where it's assembled. Then our final step, the release, and I've talked about this, so these assembled viruses, they can leave the host in one of two ways. Either you have budding, which is where the virus just buds off one at a time over a long period of time, or you can have cell lysis where the host cell burst open, and you can have hundreds of viruses released all at once. Um, budding, the host cell can survive. Lysis, the host cell is going to be killed during this release. While the virus hijacks the host cell, the virus is usually going to cause some type of damage to that host cell. These are called cytopathic effects. So they're virus-induced damage to that host cell. In different cytopathic effects, you can see the host cell can have a change in size and shape. Um, you can have the production of cytoplasmic inclusion bodies or more other types of inclusion bodies. Um, Host cells may fuse together and you get a multinucleated cell that looks kind of weird. Cell lysis, where the cell is actually killed when the virus escapes. Um, the virus can alter the cell DNA 
or it can transform these cells into cancerous cells. In your book, if you look at table 6.3, this is going to show some human viruses and some of those cytopathic changes that you can see from that virus. So we'll just look at, for example, the top one, smallpox virus. This virus causes the host cell to round up and inclusion bodies to appear. Um, if we go down the list, if you look at, um, what's a good one? Poliovirus. Poliovirus, it escapes or it's released with cell lysis. So the host cell is actually killed when the polio poliovirus is released. So definitely take a look at that. Um, there's also some pictures showing different types of host cells and how they have changed due to a viral infection. Some animal viral infections are persistent infections. This is when a cell can harbor the virus and the cell is not immediately lysed right away. So persistent, persistent infections, the virus can kind of hide there for a while and then it will show up later. So. These persistent infections, they can last for weeks or even the host lifetime. And several can periodically reactivate every once in a while, so they have this chronic latent stage. Um, and there's some examples here. So the measles virus, it remains hidden in the brain cells for many years, and then it can be reactivated later on. Um, herpes is a really good example. So herpes simplex virus can cause cold sores or genital herpes. So herpes stays with the host for the host's entire lifetime. And then when that host gets really stressed out, that's when the cold sores show up or the genital herpes can show up. So they periodically reactivate every once in a while. Um, another one, chicken pox and shingles. Most of you um, have probably gotten the chicken pox vaccination when you're little, but if you're older, back in the, um, before the 1990s, probably, I'm not sure when the chicken pox vaccination came out, but if you're born before the 1990s, you probably had chicken pox as a child. And that chicken pox virus is still inside of your cells, it's hiding there. And this is why we're seeing a lot of older people develop shingles. And shingles shows up when someone has had chicken pox in the past and then they get stressed out or they have health issues and then they're going to develop the shingles part of it. So these different viruses, um, we talked a little bit about the cytoplasmic effects so you can have this viral damage. And one of them was um, the cell could be altered into a cancerous cell so some animal viruses, they enter the host cell and they permanently alter its genetic material, resulting in cancer, and that's called transformation of the cell. Um, mammal tissues that are capable of initiating tumors, are, are, or mammal viruses, sorry, that are capable of initiating these tumors are called onconoviruses. And one example is the um, papillomavirus, which causes cervical cancer. So nowadays they have a vaccination for these viruses. I believe if you're under, well I know five years ago maybe, if you were under the age of 14 or if you were not sexually active yet, you could get a vaccination for this virus um, because they have linked it to uh, certain forms of cervical cancer. So, so far we have looked at um, the replication of animal viruses. The other type of virus we're going to look at is the bacteriophages. So bacteriophage, I mentioned it in part one, but just to remind you, bacteriophages are bacterial viruses, or they're a lot of times called phages. So in bacteriophages, only the nucleic acid enters the cytoplasm of the bacteria cell. So there's no uncoding step in the multiplication cycle. The release of the virus usually results in cell lysis, and that's called a lytic cycle. And we'll look at this multiplication cycle on the next part. So steps in bacteriophage replication, so you still have absorption, the virus has to bind to that host cell, 
penetration, only the genome enters into the host cell. So no part of the capsid can enter in, just the genome, so the DNA or RNA. Then you have replication, so that genome takes over the host cell, you make all the viral components. Next step, number four, you assemble these viral components. There's maturation, where the viruses are completely formed. And then you have lysis and release, and that's where the virus is going to leave the bacteria cell to infect other bacteria cells. So absorption and penetration. This is showing the absorption and penetration part. So again, I'm going to stress this because it's probably going to be a question on the exam. In bacteriophages, only the nucleic acid enters into the host cell. So you can see that we have our bacteriophage. It has the head part, so it has the capsid region, and then basically it's like a little injection part of the virus that's going to inject the viral nucleic acid into your host cell. The bottom picture is showing, um, you can kind of see an E. coli cell in the middle, it's just covered in bacteriophages. And you can see there's lots and lots of them. And there's even some that are inside. So once you have um, the penetration of your viral DNA or RNA, then what happens is it can go through what's called the lytic cycle. So you have um, absorption starting at the top, and now we're going to go counterclockwise. So to the left, you have penetration, your viral DNA or RNA is injected in. You duplicate all the parts, assemble them. There's maturation of the virus, and then the virus will break out during lysis and release up at the top. So if all of these steps happen right away in your bacteria cell, it's called the lytic cycle. There's another type of cycle that can happen, it's called the lysogenic cycle or lysogeny. This is when you have a silent virus infection. So some DNA bacteriophages are called temperate phages. So they undergo absorption, penetration, but you don't have viral replication that occurs right away. Instead of um, going into duplication and assembly and maturation of the virus, the viral genome is going to insert itself into the bacteria genome, and it becomes what's called an inactive prophage. So basically that means that the DNA that is injected in just can hide in that bacteria cell for a little bit. That prophage DNA, it's copied during cell division of that bacteria cell, and this results in lots of bacteria cells that are carrying that viral genome. So the host cells infected with prophages. That's the lysogeny or lysogenic stage. So usually this is longer. Um, your viral DNA gets incorporated into the bacteria DNA. And then it can be passed on from generation to generation. For viruses, they're kind of hard to cultivate and identify in the lab, and that's because they're obligate intracellular parasites. So remember, obligate intracellular parasites, they have to live inside of a host cell in order to reproduce and grow. So in order to cultivate and identify animal viruses, we have to give the virus an appropriate cell in which it can replicate and grow. So there are a few methods that have been um, developed for cultivating these viruses in the lab. So you can have cell or tissue cultures set up in petri dishes and then you infect those cells with the virus. Um, other methods, they take a bird embryo and they inject the virus into that bird embryo or they use live animal inoculation. So they use some type of rodent like a guinea pig or rat in order to do this type of technique. If you look on the picture on the left, this is showing the tissue culture. So we can grow cells in a petri dish, and you can see all those cells, the dark purple circles are the nuclei of the cells. If you infect a cell with a virus, it usually kills some of the viruses, and that forms this clear plaque. So that just shows that the virus has wiped out all the cells in that area. 
And if you look at the middle, right under the word plaque, you can see some cells that look kind of abnormal, and that's due to the virus. It's some of those um, cytoplasmic effects that we've looked at. On the right-hand side, this is showing you the bird embryo method right here. So they just take eggs, and then they can inoculate different parts of the egg. They can inoculate the virus right into the embryo itself, or they can inoculate the virus into the egg yolk or other parts of the egg. And then that virus will infect those cells. It can grow, and we can culture it in the lab. So medically important viruses, viruses are most commonly cause of acute infections. So these are very um, short infections or infections that come on very fast. And there's several billion viral infections per year. Some viruses have extremely high mortality rates. Um, so right now it is, well, it's the beginning of August in 2014. And there's been a lot on Ebola in the news. So Ebola has a very, very high mortality rate of about 90%, but it's going down, and you probably heard on the news, it's down to about 60% for the mortality rate. And that's because we have more information about the Ebola, and people um, notice their signs and symptoms faster with this. So there's um, possible connections of viruses to chronic diseases of an unknown cause. So remember, some of these viruses, they can hide in our cells and um, they can show up later on. And this could be linked to other types of diseases that we have, don't really know that much about. And then besides the medical importance, viruses play major roles in Earth's ecosystems. So almost every bacteria, every animal, even some plants, they can have viral infections. So in order to detect and treat animal viral infections, um, they're very difficult to grow in the lab. Like I just showed you, you have to have very good techniques and you have to have living tissue in order to grow viruses. So usually viruses, you don't take a sample, you look more at the patient's signs and symptoms or the overall clinical picture. If you do need to take an appropriate sample, you need to take a sample, you need to infect a cell culture, and then look for certain cytopathic effects. So certain viruses do certain things to the host cell. You can also screen for parts of the virus if you're looking for a specific gene in that viral DNA or you can screen for an immune response to the virus, so using antibodies and a little more complex. And viruses are pretty hard to treat. You have to use antiviral drugs. These drugs usually have very si serious side effects because in order to get rid of a virus, you usually have to destroy the host cell that has the virus in it. So that's gonna cause a lot of damage to the host organism because you're basically killing part of that host organism to get rid of the virus. The last part of this chapter is looking at prions and other infectious particles. So these particles are kind of similar to viruses. Um, they do cause disease. They've been linked to certain diseases that are really important. Prions are misfolded proteins that contain no nucleic acid. and these prions are extremely resistant to our usual sterilization techniques, so they have a very high resistance to um, chemicals and boiling water and other sterilization methods we'll get to later in the semester. So these prions, they have been linked to transmiss transmissible spongiform encephalitis and fatal ne neurodegenerative diseases. So these are pretty common in animals, so you can find it in sheep and goats. Um, mad cow disease, which is a type of spongiform encephalitis, we see that in mad cow disease. There's wasting disease in elk, and then in humans we have creutzfeldt jakob syndrome or disease that has been linked to a uh, prion. And for some reason these molecules really like to go into the brain. Um, I have read some stuff or heard some stuff that they may even be linked to Alzheimer's. So I hopefully think 
um, they're looking into that a little bit more to help understand Alzheimer's. Other non-cellular infectious agents, so there's something called a satellite virus. These are viruses that depend on other viruses in order to replicate. So this gets a little complicated. We have adeno-associated viruses. These are viruses that only replicate if the cell is infected with adenovirus and the adeno-associated virus. Um, there's delta agents, which are naked strands of RNA expressed only when the cell is also infected with hepatitis B. So some things only replicate if they have their partner with them in the same cell. And then finally we have the viroids. These are short pieces of RNA. They don't have the protein. And most of these, or all of them, have only been identified in plants. And basically they make the fruit of plants look weird. So you can see on the left hand side we have a normal potato next to potatoes produced by a plant that has a viroid infection. And then you can also get weird shaped tomatoes. There's another one shown here.